Well, this morning we are continuing this series we're doing right now where we are asking two very simple questions. What is this thing we call church supposed to actually be like by God's definition? Not ours, not our opinions, not our cultures, but if we actually just read what the Bible says about church, what do we discover? And then what might we need to change here at SCC to do church better, to give God what he actually wants um, from us as a church? And, of course, we are going through the book of Acts, which talks about how the church began at the beginning to find the answers to those questions. We're going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, uh, which today brings us to chapter 15, and possibly one of the most important things we will talk about in this entire series. Um, because in Acts chapter 15, the church at the very beginning of the church history here is faced with a really big question. Uh, which may not sound like a big question to you when you first hear it, but, but stay with me and you'll see why it's a big deal. The question was basically this. Does a person who is not Jewish have to basically become Jewish before they can truly become a Christian? Right? Do they have to become Jewish before you can be a Christian? So if you weren't Jewish, you didn't do that, you think you're a Christian, maybe you have to go back and start over. I don't know. You know, because, see, the idea is, from like page one of the Bible through the beginning of Jesus' ministry on this earth, through Acts chapter 9, everything is pretty Jewish, okay? Because from page 1, the Bible tells a story of this God named Yahweh, uh, who created everything we see and know, and who eventually chose the Jewish people to be his special people on this earth, to let the rest of the world know about him. And as, excuse me, as part of all that, God does all sorts of amazing things for them and through them along the way, including giving them all these laws and all these rituals to follow for how God wanted to be worshipped, how he wanted his people to live. And God sends them Jewish prophets uh, through whom he promises to send a Jewish savior one day to them, who we now know as Jesus. Jesus himself was Jewish. Um, as far as his human side went, he was a Jewish rabbi as far as his theology went. And his teaching, he also had Jewish disciples who eventually came to understand that not only is he the savior that was promised, but as the savior, he's actually like the son of Yahweh. He, he's part of Yahweh, the God of the Jewish people. And even after Jesus dies on the cross to save us and God raises him back to life that first Easter and the church begins, man, 99% of the church at the beginning are all Jewish <laughs> because the entire movement of Christianity came out of the Jewish religion with thousands of years behind it of history and rituals and traditions and laws from this God of the Jews about how to live and worship him. But then in Acts chapter 10, as we saw a few weeks ago, suddenly some non-Jewish people start putting their faith in Jesus and joining the church. And some of the early Jewish Christians start to ask, okay, so how's this going to work? Because <laughs> they don't know all the, the history. They don't have all the background. Can, can you just like walk into the middle of this thing and, and start following God, start following Jesus? I mean, from the beginning until like now, this has always been about his relationship with the Jews, like, like that. So how's this going to work now? Do these guys have to become Jewish before they can become Christians? It's a big question you don't want to get wrong because your entire eternity depends on it, <laughs> okay? So it's a very big deal. After all, if you're not Jewish, then you don't have all the background and the, of the culture. You don't necessarily know all of God's laws and all of his rituals. And hey, before you put your trust in Jesus, who knows what kind of stuff you did, right? You weren't trying to follow Yahweh till he got your attention. So who knows what kind of weird spiritual or physical stuff you did that you may bring into the church with you if you don't know better, that God doesn't approve of. Especially put yourself back in the first century in Roman culture. Oh my goodness, people who became Christians, they would have worshipped the emperor, they would have worshipped Zeus, done all sorts of weird stuff. And one big concern for the church, the Jewish Christians, was, man, what if a non-Jewish person hears about Jesus, wants to put their trust in him, they do, they join the church, but before they can learn what it means to follow him, they bring all this garbage with them, and it impacts the church negatively. Aren't we going to end up far from God's definition of what church was supposed to be? Because if that happens enough, that's not good. <laughs> so shouldn't there be some kind of Judaism 101 class for all of us? You know, let's start with Genesis. You're excited about Jesus. That's great. Let me, let me, let me teach you some of the Old Testament laws. Learn the rituals. Uh, if you're a guy, get circumcised like the Old Testament said to. That's a big deal to Jewish people because it was this symbol that you and your family forever would be God's people under his law. So shouldn't we go back and do all that and then we can follow Jesus? What's the right answer? Shouldn't non-Jews become Jewish first? Then we can truly be saved. 
Let's see what they discovered here. And we can get to listen in on their conversation. This is cool. Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 1. It says, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. It is not possible. Okay? This brought the apostle Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with those guys. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem, where the, like, the leaders of the church were, and see the apostles and the elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the non-Jews, the Gentiles, had been converted. And this made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said that Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, now notice much, by the way, circle, underline, highlight much, because it goes by in like three words in that verse, but this was after much discussion, okay? Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. That was back in Acts chapter 10, we read a few weeks ago. Look at this, verse 8. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just like he did to us. God did not discriminate between us and them. Look at this. For he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles this burden that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Okay, stop there for a second, because you can't miss what Peter just said. Did you get what he just said? Because basically, here's the thing about it, this question they're trying to answer. Should they become Jews? Should they follow the law? Peter goes, guys, whether you're Jewish or not, nobody has kept the law. So what would be the point, right? None of us have kept all the rituals and the stuff perfectly. Even if you are Jewish, no one is perfect according to God's standard. I mean, if you, if you doubt that, look at just the Ten Commandments here. Let's do a quick quiz, okay? Keep your own score. Don't keep your neighbor's score. They'll keep their own. And sometimes we like to do that. Oh, you're doing terrible. No, think about yourself if you're watching the home. Same for you. Think about this. Give yourself a quiz. How many of these have you ever broken in your life? I'm talking even once. Well, when I was four, counts. <laughs> Have you ever broken these? How about commandment one and two? We can throw them up there together because they're kind of in the same realm there. In commandments one and two, God commands you to keep him absolutely first in your life. Absolutely first place. You never put anything before him. Okay? And number two, you never worship any idols. Don't make an idol. Don't worship an idol. Okay? Ever break those? <laughs> How many times this week did you idolize someone in the sense of putting their opinion, their them, before God? Right? How about commandment number three? Commandment number three, God says, don't misuse his name. Ever misuse his name? Even if just as simple as swapping out a curse word for his name? One time. That's all it takes. God says, you don't misuse my name. Number four, he commands you, if you're going to try, if you say, I'm going to be good by God's Ten Commandments, okay, then that means you can never do any work on Saturday. He commands you every Saturday to rest. As a statement that I don't belong to my work, I belong to him, Right? So have you ever done any work, yard work, homework, any work on a Saturday ever in your life? If so, you broke that command. Number five, he says to honor your parents. <laughs> Everyone in here has been a teenager, so I'm assuming we've all broken that one at some point, right? Think about it. Have you ever dishonored your parents in any way? That's one of his commands. Commandment number six, don't murder. You might go, okay, finally. Well, hopefully you say it, finally. There's one you haven't done. But the New Testament clarifies that and says if you've even hated someone, you're guilty of that part. You ever hate someone? Hmm. How about the next one? Commandment number seven. Don't commit adultery. Don't, don't have sex with someone you're not married to. Jesus clarifies that in the New Testament, though, and says if you even think about it, you've broken that command. You even have lust in your heart for someone you're not married to, you broke that command. All right, number eight. Don't steal. Plain and simple. <laughs> you ever steal something? Oh, no, I'm not a thief. Really? You ever take office supplies home? Ever take some, anything that wasn't yours? And one reason from the store you didn't pay for it? It counts. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a holy God who wants perfection. Have you ever stolen anything? Ever. It counts. How about music? How about downloading a movie that you, weren't, that you didn't pay for? Someone who made that. Who depends on that for their livelihood, for their food, their shelter. That that's how they get paid. You stole from them. You stole their artwork. As an artist, that's a big deal to me. <laughs> Number nine. You ever give false testimony? You ever tell a lie? Ever? 
No, you just did. Okay, so <laughs> don't, don't think that we're getting away with this. Ever tell a lie at all? Lying is a sin. And then number 10, don't covet. Don't look at something someone else is or something someone else has and say, I want that. Like, er, I need that. Dude, our culture trains you to do that. What do you think commercials are? Commercials are 30 second covet fests, okay? Man. And then here's the kicker. The Bible says you break even one of those one time and it's too late. That's it. Because the same God who said one and two said number 10, right? Well, I didn't murder someone, but, but I did covet. It's all the same God's law. Because you break one one time, you're guilty of breaking all of it. And see, here's the thing. As Paul says later in the New Testament, anyone who says to themselves, well, I'm just going to be good enough for God. I'll just follow the Ten Commandments. Paul goes, don't you realize the only thing the Ten Commandments ever really do is show you how badly you need his forgiveness. <laughs> no one is going to make it trying to keep those because we're broken way to our course. We don't just do one or two bad things. We're like broken as far as human beings. If you don't believe me, think about the last time you looked at our world and said, man, what's wrong with people? <laughs> Right? Our world is not doing that well, doing it our way instead of God's way. But every day, you and I make more selfish choices that just add to the problem because there's something deep inside us that's broken. So wondering, well, does a person have to keep all those before they can truly follow Jesus? Peter's like, guys, why do you think Jesus came to save us? Because <laughs> we can't do it. That, that's just 10 records of everything we can't do right, <laughs> okay? Of how we will never be good enough for God. On our own. And in God's legal system, that means every one of us deserves the punishment that comes with breaking those, which is eternity in hell. Right? You might say, but it was just one raisin at the store. How many of you know the length of time it takes to commit a crime has nothing to do with how long you're punished for it? You can murder someone in about a minute, yet you will go to prison for the rest of your life. Hell, it was just five seconds. It doesn't matter. It's about who you offended, it's about what you did. You offended God, right? So this is really serious, and the punishment is hell forever. But Peter's point is, that's why God sent Jesus. So if you're expecting people to perform to this before they can trust Jesus, why? Nobody can do it. That's why we need Jesus. That's why God sent him in the first place, because we're not good enough on our own, and we never will be. So God sent his son to live that life for us, on your behalf, right? You ever get like a free ticket somewhere really cool to a concert or Disneyland or something? Someone like someone else pays your way in because you couldn't? Jesus did the ultimate version of that, right? He came 2,000 years ago. God sent his one and only son to do what we couldn't do for us. He lived that perfect life of trust and faithfulness and obedience to God on your behalf, right? Then he took the hell you deserved in your place. That's what the cross is about. It's God dying that death, that hell, taking it on himself, so you don't have to. And every time we've broken one of those commands, Jesus died for that in your place. So you don't have to. Then three days later, he comes back to life because anyone can claim to be God and die. Jesus actually like, comes back to life and validates, yeah, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to God except through me. You're not going to get there on your own. So you might as well trust him, right? And it's his gift because we couldn't earn it. So we don't have to earn None of it's based on anything you can or will do for him. It's all based only on what he did for you, right? It's on his mercy and who he is. And no conditions, no merit on our part needed. All you can do is respond to him just like any gift. Christmas is coming. You know, someone might get you a gift. What are your options there? Accept it and use it or say, no, thanks. I have enough socks. You know, whatever it might be. <laughs> I mean, that's it. It's a gift. All you can do is respond. Take it and use it or say, no, thanks. And Jesus says, if you want to take it and use it, you just got to make a U-turn in life. Stop going your own way and do what you should have done in the first place and submit to him, and he'll save you and help you. He'll actually supernaturally help you follow him from that point on. And he'll actually credit his perfect life to you, your account. Man, wouldn't it be cool if someone just randomly said, I'm going to credit a million dollars to your bank account today. It's like, okay, cool. What do I have to do? Nothing. Just accept it. When it comes through, hit the button that says accept that simple, okay? Jesus does that with eternity. I'm going to credit my perfection to you. So this is all erased. Your record's clear before God. And all, it's, period, it's done, right? And that literally changes everything. And that is Peter's point here in the first part of this chapter. Jewish or not, the only way anyone gets saved is through Christ. Because no one can be perfect except him, <laughs> Not by working our way, trying to keep Old Testament law, because none of us have kept it perfectly. That's why God made a way for everyone 
through Jesus. With him so far? Make sense? I see like two people nodding. Just play the video back later. Okay, let's go on to verse 12. So the whole assembly became silent, it says, as they listened to Barnabas and Paul then telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. We read some of that last week. We read it in our house churches this week as we're going back and forth. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon, as in Simon Peter, has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. In the words of the prophets from the Old Testament, uh, they're in agreement with this. As it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David, King David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. Look at this, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. It's not just about Jews anymore. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things? Things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, from blood. We'll come back to why they singled those out in a minute. Uh, for the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. In other words, if you're worried about them, oh, you know, what if they don't know about Moses? James is saying, don't worry about the non-Jewish guys not knowing about Moses in the Old Testament. There's still plenty of opportunity for them to learn about that, okay? Verse 22. Then the apostles and the elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, this was not the same Judas from the Gospels, called Barsabbas, um, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. And with them, they sent the following letter. You can just imagine, you're getting this letter from the church from the first century. Here it is. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. You could say, and in Seaside, okay? <laughs> Greetings. We've heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Circle, underline, highlight. It's not just about their opinion. All that much discussion. They're trying to listen. What is God saying? It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You'll do well to avoid these things. Farewell. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. And that's where we'll stop for today. We'll pick it up in our house churches this week for the next part there. But um, so here's your notes. So what's the observation for today? Long story short, after prayerful consideration, right, listening to God, considering what does scripture actually say, not what's our opinion, what does scripture say, what does the Bible say, and having mature family discussion as a church, the early leaders discovered, not decided, <laughs> discovered really, that God was basically saying, no, you don't have to become Jewish and keep the 613 laws, that's how many rabbis have counted, in the Old Testament to become a Christian. The point of becoming a Christian is acknowledging, I can't do it on my own, right? Being made right with God, having eternal life, is not about working your way to Him in any way, shape, or form. It's about His grace. It's about what He did for us, not what we can do for Him. The only thing we can do is either accept it or reject it. It's respond to him, as Paul says in Romans. It's all, that's all we can do is respond to him one way or the other. So along those lines, as a kind of an extra bonus here, we can actually easily become one family of Christians, whether you're Jewish or Greek or Gentile or American or whatever, uh, because we're all saved by God's grace. I'll put that back up in a second. First, look at what Paul says in Ephesians here. He says, Christ himself united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death 
Look at this next part. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near, right? Now all of us can come together, come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. It's such a beautiful verse. I love that. And we're all one family now. We're all saved by God's grace. Now, at the same time, we have to understand, that doesn't mean this is a free credit card to go sin. It's like, cool, so I don't have to keep the law? Well, then I can go steal, murder, kill, you know, sleep around, and I'm still saved? Uh, no. If that's your attitude, then you don't get it. Right? You don't really understand this. Imagine if your best friend died to give you his lung because you needed it. Like, he gave up his life so you could have a lung that you needed. Would your response seriously be, well, cool, now I can go smoke like crazy and do drugs and like mess that lung up? Really? You have no honor for the person that gave their life to save you. I don't think you understand what they did for you, right? That's a very small thing in comparison to this. Now look what Paul says in Romans. He says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Because we know, well, I can't do it anyway, so I might as well just live it up, right? And Paul says, are you kidding me? By no means. That's... That's the best English can do. Read that in Greek. It is like super strong, like no stinking way. I mean, he, he is so emphatic when he says that part. No way. Look at this. Don't you know when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you're slaves to the one you obey. You ever think of it that way? Oh, I'm just going to go live it up. Did you ever realize that you're a slave to living it up then? That, that you're not in control, that living it up is actually in control of you, Right? Whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or you got a choice. You can be a slave to obedience, which leads to righteousness. You can be a slave to Jesus or a slave to sin, but those are your only two options, right? But thanks be to God that through that though you used to be slaves to sin, you've come to obey from your heart, key phrase, from your heart, the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I'll put that back up if you're still working on writing it down, but... But get Paul's point, okay? Yes, it's about grace. Yes, it's a free gift. But man, Jesus saves you from a sin, right? Why would you want to go back to it? If you get that, if you really understand what he did for you, how could you live a life characterized by sin for one more moment? How could you even want to? When he went to hell for that stuff, right? You wouldn't. If you really get this, you would want to live for the Savior who saved you, right? Besides, in order to truly become a follower of Jesus, what do you have to do? You have to make that U-turn we talked about, which implies, hey, I realize the way I'm going stinks. <laughs> it's just causing me emptiness and guilt and shame and pain and broken relationships. None of this is working. So I'm going to turn around. I'm going to turn my back, take off that old identity, and put my trust in Jesus and follow him. Right? You turned away from it. So why would you go, yay, Jesus, I'm going to go back to this. That makes no sense at all. Maybe you didn't really get what he did for you and how big of a deal sin is to God. But as a result of choosing to follow him, man, that's, he forgave you for all of that stuff, right? Everything you've ever done that offended God, he gave you a new life. He promises, man, you stick with me, you have eternal life. It's, it's signed, sealed, done. There's no wondering, right? Other religions don't promise that. Maybe you'll make it. Jesus goes, you can know for sure. It is finished. If you trust me, it's secure. Your present, your past is forgiven, your present makes sense, your future is safe if you put your trust in Jesus, right? And God actually adopts you into his family, the Bible says. You get all the benefits of that. He doesn't just save you like, okay, you know, like superheroes, you're safe, citizen, see you later. God's like, no, I want you in my family. You're my child. You're my son. You're my daughter. And all the benefits of that, my goodness, freedom from your past, that new identity as this child. Read Ephesians 1 and 2 sometime very slowly and mark down everything those two chapters say about who you are in Christ. It will blow your mind, the stuff God gives you as a Christian. Ephesians 1 and 2. And you actually want to follow him. You want to obey him from the heart, out of love, not because you have to, not to somehow earn salvation. You do it because he already gave it to you. You do it because you're already saved. Look at what Paul says here in Ephesians, in Ephesians 2, part of the, the chapter I mentioned. It is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast, right? You get to heaven, no one's going to be up there. You know how I got here, don't you? Well, I saved like four kittens from the railroad track. You know, well, I got you beat. I, I fed like five homeless people, you know? None of that's going to be the case in heaven. It's all going to be, man, thank you, Jesus, that I'm here. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But look at this. A lot of times we read that verse and we skip the next one. Look what it says right after that. For we are God's handiwork, look at this, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
Get what Paul's saying there? You're not saved by what you do. You're not saved by doing good stuff. You're saved only because of Jesus. But once God saves you, he has good stuff he wants you to do. <laughs> he has purpose for you. He has, has a plan. He has stuff that's just waiting for you to, to do that will have just amazing impacts on yourself, on the world, all kinds of stuff. Now, true, a new Christian may not always know what exactly to do to follow Jesus, right? What it is that God has for them to do, especially if they have no Old Testament background. So that's why the church puts those specific things in that letter. Then, Look at verse 29 again. The church says, okay, here, guys, abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, from sexual immorality. Those were things they picked out because back then, those would have been the major struggles in that culture. Right? So if they were writing a letter to us today, sexual immorality would still be on the list probably. <laughs> but they might add, you know, drug use or, you know, pornography on the internet. I got, that would be sexual immorality. But, but take that as, okay, since you guys are new to this Christianity thing, before the Holy Spirit teaches you and shows you what it looks like to follow Jesus, let me just hit some highlights. Here's some stuff right now that's very common that you should walk away from. This, these are things God would say, mm, no, you need to stop doing that. We don't do that in our family. Right? You're part of my family now. You ever have someone in your family say, like, as you're a little kid and you're about to do something, your parents go, no, no, we don't do that in our family, right? God's that way too. He's like, you're part of my family now. We don't, we don't live that way in our family. We live for better things. We live by a higher, better standard. We do things differently. So, so Acts is just, they're throwing those specific things out because those are things God wouldn't like. So if you're a vampire, stop drinking blood, okay? That is something God doesn't like. But, um... But those were things that would have been very common. So you think of the most common things God says not to do in our culture. That was what he put in there for us if he wrote that letter to you today. Basically, get on track with Jesus. Follow him. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. And right away, here's some stuff to get out of your life like immediately. All right. All right. So enough talking for me. Here are our chat questions for today. How are we doing with this? If you were to put yourself somewhere on that chart up there, okay? Where would you be? If you're honest, okay? Would you be on the left side there where you're honestly thinking, Psh, forget this God stuff, man. The only reason I'm here, I, I just clicked on this by accident on the internet. You know, the only reason I'm here is because someone promised me lunch or, or made me come. You know, I don't even care. I'm living myself. I'm not interested in God. Be honest, okay? Or are you more in the middle where it's like, honestly, you are still trying to work your way to God. Like, you know the right answer is up here, but in your everyday actual practice, if someone were looking at your life, and trying to figure out Christianity, they'd think you were trying to earn your way to God. Are you still trying to prove you're worth something to him? Are you trying to prove you're worth loving? He goes, stop. I already proved that. I loved you before you were even born. I loved you first, remember? <laughs> or are you living in grace on the far side there? Where you realize, man, there's nothing I can do to earn his love. You know, there's not, there's always, he's always loved me unconditionally. There's nothing I can do to earn salvation because I've already blown it. All I can do is accept that gift and gratefully live for him. Walk with him every day. Are you living in grace, grateful for what he's done, following him and obeying him? Yes, but in relationship. It's very different than just trying to obey a set of rules to you know, please some cosmic cop or something, right? I, I do what Amy wants most of the time uh, because I love her, because I want to make her happy, right? Not because I'm afraid she's gonna you know, zap me or something. Are you being in the context of relationship because you love him out of family, because he adopted you, and that's your identity. Where would you put yourself? Then question number two, how's that working for you? <laughs> if you're on the grace side, it's like, oh man, I just need more of that. I want to be more next week. If you're living for yourself still, honestly, how's that working? In my experience, it doesn't work well. I've lived just a little over half my life as a Christian, half my life not. I'll tell you, the half as a Christian, not necessarily easier, but way better. <laughs> I know what the other half's like. It's empty, it's hopeless, it's pointless. So how's it really working for you? I'm living my way. Great. How's that working for you? Or if you're in the middle, trying to earn my way to God, how's that working? My experience, it's very exhausting. Jesus goes, come to me. My burden's light. I'll give you rest. Right? And then question three, man, where do you want to be this time next week? You want to keep stay where you are? In some cases, it might, might be a good thing. Or do you want to end up somewhere better next week? There you go. And then take a few minutes to talk about that. And then, of course, share a prayer request with the other people around you. Pray with each other. Take about, yes. Six minutes for it, and uh, we will finish things up after that. Ready, set, go.